Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Strand. My name is Sabir. For a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until, after over 92 years, Strand is the sole survivor, still run by the Bass family, still selling used and new books and running 400 events a year. Thank you. So tonight, I'm thrilled to have with us Daniel Levitin, who's here to celebrate and discuss his brand new book, Successful Aging. A neuroscientist explores the power and potential of our lives. As the title says, Dr. Levitin is a neuroscientist as well as the founding dean of arts and humanities at the Minerva School at KGI in San Francisco, a professor emeritus at McGill University. He's also a cognitive psychologist and the author of several best-selling and beloved books, including This Is Your Brain on Music, The World in Six Songs, The Organized Mind, and A Field Guides to Lies. So if you'd like to live stream or live tweet the event, his handle for Twitter are at Dan Levitin, and on Instagram it's at Daniel Levitin Official. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Levitin, and oh, sorry, d please join me in welcoming Dr. Levitin and successful aging to Strand. Well, thank you so much. Uh, all of you for coming. Uh, it's such a delight to be here at an independent bookstore with all of you. Uh, independent bookstores are, are gathering places for ideas, for, for people, for uh, thoughts, and it's a, a kind of a nice community space that we have this here. And um, it, it fulfills a role that no other place in soci society fills these days, it seems. And uh, whether you buy a book or not, just come here and, and meet other people and engage with new ideas. Um, I think it's a wonderful thing. So thank you very much again to The Strand for, for hosting us. Um, as you heard, I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist by training, and um, that comes with some pluses and minuses. Uh, one of the minuses is my parents uh, are always asking me for advice. And uh, well, I mean, maybe that's a plus. But uh, when they turned 80, they said, OK, smarty pants, you're a neuroscientist. Uh, what advice do you have for us uh, about what we can do so that we can uh, approach the coming years and, and do our best? And I said, well, let me, let me get back to you on that. And I looked around for books about the aging brain that I could recommend to them, and I couldn't find one. Uh, I, I couldn't find anything that really talked about the way the brain changes over the lifespan, the changes that are uh, specific to aging, say after 60 and after 70, and nothing that gave good advice uh, for what you could actually do to sort of tilt the balance in your favor, to, um, to better position yourself uh, starting at any age. To, to hit your 70s, 80s, and 90s, and beyond. And so, as with my other four books, I ended up writing the book that I wanted to read. And uh, that's what this is. And um, it w was uh, a, a wonderful experience for me. I, uh, I read over 4,000 articles, peer-reviewed articles, uh, to understand the field, and I then met in addition, I wanted there to be a human side to the story, so I met with people who I had heard about or read about, or people I knew who I thought were doing particularly well uh, for their age. And so those of you who have read my other books will uh, see some familiar faces in the book, like former Secretary of State George Shultz, uh, Joni Mitchell, Judy Collins, and some new faces, or at least new to me, people I was able to spend time with, including uh, the Dalai Lama, former uh, president of Mexico, Vicente Fox, and um, the stories of my own parents, who I ended up telling, um, I don't have any advice for you. You're doing everything just right. Uh, more on them in a minute. Uh, one of the things I learned is that I have to write things down in order to keep track of where I am. So if you'll forgive me. Um, 
I think this is an interesting time. It's in many respects the best time to be a aging and being alive in terms of medical science and medical knowledge. Uh, it's, it's an incredible time. We're all living longer. According to the World Health Organization, there are more people now, for the first time in history, more people over the age of 65 than under the age of five. And within 10 years, there'll be more people over the age of 65 than there are under the age of 18. Think about that. Uh, if we live longer and longer, um, what does that mean? What does it mean we want to spend our time doing? How is society going to regard 90-year-olds and 100-year-olds? Uh, one very practical consequence is if you're 100 and, and you've got a bunch of children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, maybe even great-great-grandchildren, at Thanksgiving, you're going to need a bigger table. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I say that only partly in jest because my wife comes from a very large family. Her grandparents each had eight kids, and each of those kids had a bunch of kids, and they had a bunch of kids, and at Thanksgiving time and at Christmas, um, grandma and grandpa had, they had 65 grandchildren and 35 great-grandchildren. It was, it was uh, you know, grandma spent all her time just writing out birthday cards. <laughs> but it wasn't superficial. She, she really took an interest in everybody. She knew that uh, Hannah was the one who uh, wanted to go to college to study biology. She knew that uh, Scotty was having trouble uh, you know, finding a job and keeping a job, but uh, he really loved kittens and dogs. I mean, she had it all, all sorted out. Um, the point here is that uh, we age in different ways, and there's no one recipe for everybody. There's no magic course of action. And I'll expand on that in a minute. But first I thought I'd, I'd kind of address an elephant that's in the room of aging, a, a kind of misconception or myth, uh, which is the myth of failing memory. One of the things we think about uh, when we think about the aging brain or older adults. I like to call them oldsters because it reminds me of youngsters and hipsters and it just sort of reinforces that it's it, maybe it's kind of cool to be an older adult. So one of the things that we think of when we think of, of oldsters is, well, you know, the societal narrative is that old age is a time of decline, of debilitation, of depression, and that turns out not to be borne out by the evidence, not at all. Uh, I'm sure there are some people who are doing poorly, but the vast majority of oldsters are doing a lot better than we give them credit for and a lot better than we think. And in one area in particular, memory, you're not consigned to a bad memory just because you're getting older. It's true there are neurological reasons that the brain slows down a little bit. It can take you a little longer to do things when you're older. but. Old person's memories are, in many cases, just as good, if not better, than younger memories. The difference is this. It's a, it's a narrative. Uh, I, I really have the best job in the world in that I get to teach college, and I meet a brand new crop of 18-year-olds every year. And I can tell you from personal experience, 18-year-olds have a lot of memory lapses. They lose their phones, they lose their keys, they, they forget after 16 weeks, they forget which classroom their class is in still. you know, they, they raise their hand and I call on them right away and they say, oh, professor, I forgot what I was gonna ask. 70-year-olds um, show up in the kitchen, they don't know why they're there, they lose their car keys and cell phones. Um, the difference is in the stories we tell ourselves. The 20 year old says, I gotta get more than five and a half hours of sleep, or gee, I, I got too much on my plate right now. The 70 year old says, this is the end. It's Alzheimer's, I'm sure it is. <laughs> Same behavior, different story. And there's quite a bit of research now that if you test oldsters in a comparable environment to the way we test memory of youngsters, the old people are doing great. 
Uh, it's true, older people have the tip of the tongue phenomenon a little more often. They, um, they lose a word that they're looking for. Uh, that happens a little more often, but to be technical about it, it's not a failure of memory. It's not that the word isn't in there. You know the word. You just can't retrieve the phonological form, the actual sounds, the letters of the word. And given time, you usually come up with it. What we think is happening is there's a kind of a neurological bottleneck where uh, you can't get the word because as an older adult, you know a lot more words or you know a lot more ideas and more things are competing to get out. There's some intriguing new research that, uh, that shows that if you swear, uh, it can break up the bottleneck. So <laughs> these taboo words, <laughs> these taboo words seem to open the floodgates uh, and, and let out that bottleneck. So, you know, the next time you're trying to think of, of uh, a, a word, you know, if, if you swear, and I, I'm not necessarily recommending this, I'm just telling you it, it works, uh, it, it may be that you'll be able to find it. So, you know, where is that blasted whatchamacallit where Last, it isn't the word you might use, but you get the picture. Um, and I mentioned that the brain does slow with age. We now understand some of the science behind this. Um, the brain is really a, a collection of electrical circuits, and the neurons are the wiring that connects uh, uh, connects different computational elements, and in order to function, they have to be insulated. You know what would happen in your house if a wire was uninsulated? You get sparks, maybe a fire, uh, and so the brain needs to have insulation around the neurons, uh, around the axons, to be uh, specific, and the neural insulation is called myelin, and the myelin sheath is just a fatty insulator um, it's created by eating fats in your diet, so the no-fat diet is not a good idea for brain health. Um, of course, you know, some fats are better than others, but uh, uh, one of the side effects of aging is that your body metabolizes vitamin B12 a little less well, and B12 is important for helping convert those fats into myelin. And so this is why many older adults get B12 shots and try to up their intake of healthy fats, especially omega-3 fatty acids. Um, but I'm mentioning all of this because it's the degradation of the myelin sheath that can cause the slowing. And yet, there are all these compensatory mechanisms that kick in uh, in old age, oldsters, oldsterville. Uh, that make up for the, the slower processing. Um, most of what we have to do when we're trying to solve problems um, involves seeing patterns in things. In fact, it's been said by George Polia, the great mathematician, and many others, that the essence of problem solving is pattern recognition, seeing a pattern. And the more experience that you've had living and experiencing uh, life and, and uh, seeing different things, the better able you are to extract patterns from the things that you observe. Um, if you, for example, need to have a, an x-ray, you definitely want a 70-year-old radiologist to read it, not a 30-year-old. The 70-year-old has seen so much more and they've had clinical feedback of, about what these little blurs and, and spots mean. Uh, similarly, if you, if you need surgery, uh, especially if it's robotic surgery where the steadiness of the person's hands aren't an issue, you want the 70-year-old surgeon who's done this operation 6,000 times. You don't want the person who's doing it their 20th time. Uh, pattern matching and experience go a long way. And I'd go so far as to say that what we normally think of as intelligence really comes down to problem solving through, through pattern matching. And older adults excel at this uh, because they've had the experience and because of neurochemical changes in the brain that allow the pattern matching mechanisms to work more efficiently. Turns out also older adults are better at solving social problems. Um, interpersonal problems, uh, much better. Um, and what we call wisdom really comes down to, to solving problems uh, that, that people 
who lack wisdom have difficulty solving. Uh, part of the reason I, I wrote the book is that I really like to change the societal narrative about what old age means. And part of it is to highlight the compensatory mechanisms and not dwell on the, the infirmities and the slowness. One of the things I, I discovered in, in putting the book together that surprised me was the role of mindset. You've all heard about uh, uh, positive psychology, perhaps, or, or more, um, uh, more popularly, just you know, have a positive attitude, pos cultivate a positive outlook. Well, it turns out this is, uh, you know, many people say this is the key to being happy, is to have a positive outlook. Uh, and, and people as different as the Dalai Lama and Warren Buffett, think about the difference there, uh, both have promoted the idea that the happiest people are people who are happy with what they have, not people who are constantly thinking about what they don't have. They practice gratitude. Uh, Warren Buffett lives in the same house that he's lived in uh, for, I think, 50, 60 years. It's not a particularly elaborate house for one of the richest people in the world, but he's happy with it. He's always been happy with it. Warren Buffett is a happy guy. He's not constantly thinking about what he doesn't have. Gratitude comes more naturally to people who are older because of neurochemical changes that start kicking in in your 60s uh, and a positive outlook. Uh, we talk about something that uh, my colleague Laura Karstensen, the great aging specialist, uh, psychologist at Stanford, calls the positivity bias. Older adults tend to remember the positive events of their lives more vividly than the negative events. When something's happening now, when they meet someone new, they focus on the positive. This is what Alison Gopnik, uh, Gopnik, another great psychologist at uh, UC Berkeley, incidentally the sister of the fabulous New Yorker writer Adam Gopnik, Alison calls this the grandparent syndrome. <laughs> Grandparents are happy. They're up. They're, they're positive in a way that the parents often are not. Um, and Unfortunately, the downside of the positivity bias is that oldsters are more vulnerable to scammers, and so we have to help the oldsters in our lives to avoid that. Um, what we did for my wife's mother when she was in her 80s and talking to anybody who called and giving them her social security number because it was such a nice man who was trying to be so helpful uh, is that we, we basically told her, um, any business decision that you have to make Give us a call any time of the day or night. We'll help you decide what to do. We didn't go so far as getting a conservatorship, although some people do that. Uh, but she she understood, she, and and um, her wisdom allowed her to do that. And we didn't have any more problems other than the time that she signed up for some solar panels that never showed up. But <laughs> fortunately, she didn't pay anything. Um, because she knew not to give her credit card out number, the credit card number out. Um, but this idea of having a positive attitude and a positive mindset um, plays into a very important notion, which is that your personality is one of the biggest predictors of how well you will age. Now, I haven't defined what I mean by aging well or successful aging. To me, Successful aging is to be able to continue to do the things that you enjoy for as long as possible, and to be healthy and to derive pleasure from life, and um, to, uh, to basically live the healthiest life possible. One of the things that surprised me in doing the research for the book, in many of those 4,000 papers, is the current research emphasis we have on lifespan. The uh, granting organizations throw lots and lots of money into helping us live to be 200. And you can make your own choice about this. I don't pretend that my views sh should be shared with other people. I just happen to have my own views. I don't think I want to live to be 200 if those last 110 years are spent in a nursing home in a stupor. Uh, I want to uh, think about within my 
lifespan, there are going to be two parts, most likely. There's going to be a health span from birth until some illness kicks in, and then a disease span. And to me, the aim is to shorten the disease span and lengthen the health span. Now, if I can lengthen the lifespan in the process, that's great, but I don't think that's the, the brass ring. The brass ring is the, the health span. And personality plays a very big role in this. Uh, people who are more conscientious, this is the biggest single factor in predicting how well you will age. It makes sense, I suppose. Conscientious people go to the doctor when they're sick. Conscientious people actually have a doctor. They know who to call. And when they go to the doctor and the doctor says, this is what you need to do, they do it. Uh, and it's, it's a very simple thing. We vary, uh, 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 we humans vary and, and differ from one another in thousands of different ways. Conscientiousness represents a cluster of about a dozen of those ways, including um, uh, stick to and dependability and reliability. And the good news is you can change. You can change your personality at any age. You're never too old to, to start, and you're never too young to start. Um, as in all things, I recommend moderation. If you're too conscientious, overly conscientious, that might turn into being obsessive compulsive. You don't want to see the doctor every time you've got an itch or some new mark on your skin. Uh, but you know, if, if, you, if you've got something worrisome and you don't see the doctor, it could turn out to be a melanoma. You, you've got to find the right balance. Um, I'll just say that changing the personality is, of course, really the goal of all the world's major religions. They are teaching us to become more compassionate, to express gratitude. Um, that's what the major religions teach, whether all their practitioners actually do it or not is a different matter. Um, and another personality component is gratitude. You can change your personality about that. The whole field of psychotherapy is devoted to the idea that you can change your personality. And psychotherapy does work, uh, as does meditation. There are a lot of different roads to get there. Another myth I want to explode is depression among older adults. Old age is not necessarily a time of depression. Old people, as I mentioned with the positivity bias, are not, as a group, sad. Uh, if, Sure, there are, there are examples. There are examples of unhappy oldsters. But the statistical trend across 72 different countries and tens of thousands of people, think for a minute, what do you think the people rate the happiest point in their lives? What age? 82. This is a highly reliable finding. So, and, and I know a number of people in their 90s who say it just kept getting better from there my wife's grandparents included. I had the opportunity also in doing the book to, to learn about a number of inspiring people. My new hero is Julia Hurricane Hawkins. I know that some of you have heard of her. How, how many just show of hands have heard of Julia Hurricane Hawkins? She's 103 years old and uh, took gold medals this year in the uh, senior games for competitive running. She didn't even start running until she was 100. <laughs> and she didn't take up competitive sports of any kind until she was 75. This is somebody who realized she could rewrite the story of her life. She could change her personality. She could change her story to be the person she wanted to be at 75 and again at 100, reinventing herself. Retired school teacher from Baton Rouge. Another hero of mine right here in New York is Carmen Herrera, who you may know of, a 104-year-old painter. She didn't sell her first painting until she was 81. And then her work was largely ignored until she was 89. But undaunted, she kept painting, she kept trying to get shows, and now her work is displayed at the Whitney, and she's a highly regarded painter at age 104. Again, you can change at any age. Uh, the list goes on and on. Um, Harry Bernstein, 96-year-old novelist who uh, wrote the novel Invisible Wall, he didn't take up writing at all until three years earlier. And then, not because he wanted to be a writer, but because he was trying to soothe himself after the death of his wife, Ruby, 
after 50 years. Um, and it seems to have worked. Um, these inspiring people, the, I, I think, teach us an important lesson. We all can do this. It's within our grasp. You might need to work with a teacher or a coach. Uh, it's important to set realistic goals. I've always wanted to play the violin. I don't think at my age I'm going to become a concert violinist, but I know that with the right teacher and some diligent practice, within a few years I could probably play in a community orchestra if that's what I really wanted to do. I could certainly play some fiddle tunes at hoedowns and, and amuse myself, if not my friends. Um, so. That's, the, that's, that's a very positive lesson that I resonated with, the idea that um, we can change the narrative. And I think we need to change it across all of society. Uh, I think younger people need to start thinking of older adults as a resource, um, not as a drain on society or a drain on resources. The most important advice I've come away with is to not retire. Keep working, whatever that work is. Now, there might be exceptions where you hate your job, your job is particularly dangerous or stressful, you get forced out. Some pilots have been forced to retire because of different international agreements about uh, age, uh, international pilots. Uh, my own father was forced to retire when he was 62. My mother was kind of forced into retirement at 70 because after a career of writing novels, 40 of them, nobody would publish her work. And I may be a biased judge, but I thought the last three or four novels she wrote were really good. So did her agent. But nobody would touch her because she was 70. And so she rewrote her story, as it were. She became a playwright, which forced her to learn a whole new vocabulary, to deal with theater people, uh, to you know, work with fundraisers and directors and audition actors. My father, at 62, after being pushed out of his job, decided to teach. And at 87, he just signed a four-year contract, extension on his contract, to continue teaching at USC. The students love him because he has experiences that the younger professors lack. He lived through all kinds of things. Um, not to get political, but I'd like to see, um, as we go into the primaries and we go into the election, I'd really like to see a ticket where there's an age spread between the people on the ticket. I think that um, older adults uh, can get too cocky and overconfident in what they know. They certainly lack some of the energy and perspective of younger adults. Um, millennials are tremendously, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always impressed by each new crop of students I get at how smart they are. The digital natives know all kinds of things intuitively, wired into their circuitry that the rest of us don't know. And um, I think a partnership is the way that we're going to solve the world's problems. As I, I, I'm not so full of hubris that I think that we boomers should be in charge of things exclusively or that we can solve the problems. It's clear we can't. And for any millennials in the audience, I'd like to apologize on behalf of my generation for leaving you the planet in the condition that we did. Um, as my friend Joni Mitchell uh, wrote about in a song, uh, the, uh, that she released on her album Shine. Um, I had the rare opportunity of, of hear, having her play it for me as she was writing it and hearing it develop. Um, we, we failed to live up to the Woodstock, Woodstock promise of, of peace and love and understanding and a better world. Uh, and so the millennials are, are gonna be stuck with fixing it, uh, but I think there's certainly a lot of people in my generation who wanna help and who have some, some insights uh, and want to make right for you, working together. Last story I, I, I want to tell about an inspiring person is um, having met the Dalai Lama, and I'm happy to answer questions about it. It was a really extraordinary experience. We had over an hour together, and I had read a lot of what he's written uh, when we met uh, a couple of summers ago, he had just published his 125th book. 
he's age 83, he's writing them faster than I can read them. I'm still stuck on book number 59, not because it isn't good, but I just can't keep up. Uh, and so I'm, I'm eager to get, to get caught up. Uh, he really does believe that the secret to happiness is to practice compassion and gratitude. And he meditates on this several hours a day. He meets uh, with people who come to see him and to listen to them. And a lot of people say this. There aren't very many people in the world who really put this into practice. He comes to mind, Mother Teresa. A lot of television evangelists talk a good story. You rarely see it. But I had an extraordinary experience just last night here in New York that um, I think was the most moving demonstration of that I've ever seen. It happened right here in, in this part of town. Uh, I was getting on the F train with a friend of mine, Peter. And uh, Peter is very into the, uh, deeply into the Jewish teaching uh, that m much more important than believing in God or loving God is loving your fellow human which can be hard to do. Uh, we disagree with people. We don't uh, feel comfortable around them. So Peter and I had just missed an F train. And um, we're standing on the platform, and a homeless guy came up to us. He was really disheveled, uh, about 35 years old. He um, had peed his pants. He was the kind of person that even the most compassionate person would probably want to back away from not to be too graphic, but he had a very fresh, big piece of mucus halfway between his nose and his mustache, just glistening in the, in the uh, lights of the subway station. And as he walked towards Peter, Peter walked towards him. And the guy started talking. And at some point, Peter said, I'm sorry, you're talking too soft. I can't hear you. There, there weren't trains going by. The guy was just talking super soft. And Peter listened to him respectfully and looked him in the eye and leaned in. And then Peter said, I'm sorry, I, I can't hear your words, but I feel them. And the homeless man relaxed. And Peter said, what's, what's your name? And he said, my name is Dyrell. Peter said, I'm going to play a song for you. Peter's a musician. He picked up a guitar that he had with him, and he just started writing a song, a, a beautiful, amazing song. Complicated chords, not just some country song with three chords. Complicated melody, but memorable. And he started just making lyrics up. Uh, I met, I'm, I'm down at the F train. I met Dyrell. I can see that you're not doing well. Uh, I can see you've had a hard time, and you need more than a dime. Uh, just went on and on, and the look that came over Dyrell's face was amazing. He, he lit up like a little kid. It was like he was in kindergarten, and all his cares were gone, and somebody was paying attention to him as a person. Um, and then Peter riffed on this line about, you are a man. You are a proud man with dignity. And sorry, I, it, was, it was so moving. Dyrell just melted. It was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And it made me think that this is a capacity all of us talk about wanting to have. Peter's doing it. We can all do it. It takes, it takes courage. Sorry. I think I'm, I'm upset because I know my shortcomings. I don't have that courage. But I know that I can change. And I know that I can work on it. Baby steps. Getting back to more um, Less, less emotional things. Um, I do have some practical tips uh, to, about aging that I'll end with, and then I'll, I'll pass it on to you for, for questions. Um, one practical tip is to set reasonable goals for yourself. 
Uh, you, you can aspire to anything at any age, but it's important to do baby steps. You, you don't build a house in one day. You show up and you say, today I'm going to do the foundation, or maybe I'm going to grade the, the land for the foundation. Um, and so take off bite-sized morsels. Um, and move around a bit more than you are, probably. Uh, exercise. The next time you go to a, a parking lot, uh, Park your car at the other end and walk to the store. And the next time you're confronted with an elevator, an escalator, take the stairs instead. Uh, next time you're standing in line at a subway or a grocery store, strike up a conversation with the person next to you. Baby steps, maybe not the person who uh, is most difficult to talk to, just start by talking to strangers in a line. It has a tremendous effect on how you feel your agency in the world and how you feel about yourself. Um, and it has a tremendous effect on other people. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. If you have a question, if you could just raise your hand, I can run the mic over to you. Thank you so much. This was very, very enjoyable. Um, we hear a lot, holsters, uh, about mind games and crossword puzzles. And uh, I ride the subway all the time, and I see a lot of people actually doing all these amazing uh, games. And I'm always envious. Do you, do you talk about that in your book? I do. I have a whole chapter, actually, on, uh, on cognitive enhancement. I should just tell you quickly that the book uh, has three parts. Uh, the first part is the science behind uh, aging, the aging brain, and takes up different topics separately, like memory and uh, intelligence and attention and personality change and the neural correlates of all these things. The second part is practical things you can all do. And the third part looks forward uh, at what's on the horizon. And um, the reason the first part is the science behind it is that I, I, I've devoted my life to education. I think education works. And I think it's easier to do things when you understand why you're doing them. Um, and on the brain games thing, um, it's kind of like uh, um, looking for the fountain of youth on a mountaintop. It doesn't really work that way. Uh, you can do crossword puzzles, but they just make you better at crossword puzzles. They don't make you better at anything else. <laughs> Same with Sudoku. Uh, they, they don't transfer to anything else. They, there's a little bit of evidence that doing crossword puzzles might uh, help you with word fluency, but not enough that I would do them for that reason. I do them because I like them, and, and it's entertaining. That's the reason to do it. Um, if you're worried about your memory, the best thing you can do is stay socially engaged. The most complicated thing that human beings can do is what you and I are doing right now, having a conversation. It's more complicated than brain surgery, rocket design, being a concert pianist or an astronaut. It engages every region of the brain. It involves compassion, empathy, turn-taking. So when I say uh, don't retire, a lot of that's about uh, having meaningful work and feeling valued. And really, a big part of it is the social aspect of, of being around other people. By the way, none of the brain training games have been proven to work either. You know, they're like Lumosity and these other online things. Uh, there have been a lot of, of lawsuits and uh, fines by the Federal Trade Commission about false claims. There's no magic potion you can take, whether it's NAD plus or ginkgo or, I mean, no, there's no evidence that they work. To be scientifically honest, I have to say, that doesn't mean they don't work. There's just no evidence that they do. And I'm with science. I say put your money behind something that we know works. Um, and some of the things that we thought might work turned out to be harmful. So I'd, I'd give it some time. Um, 
Yeah, thank you so much. Here's a question. You used to hear a lot more about this, and we know that loneliness is epidemic, and you mentioned social interaction. What is the latest research on, for example, you're in your 80s or 90s, and you have a partner. You're married, you're not married. In terms of the health benefits, not that we're all going to go out and find someone, but I'm, I'm curious about, you know, they used to talk a lot about that. We still talk a lot about that. It turns out that being in a, a good relationship is protective against uh, Alzheimer's and uh, dementia and cognitive decline. Uh, not every relationship is good. If you're in a bad marriage, certainly an abusive marriage, uh, you know, divorce rates among 70 people in their 70s and 80s are actually increasing uh, because it no longer has the societal stigma it had earlier. Um, being alone is not, <laughs> I, I spent some time with Secretary of State George Schultz and he was explaining to me his secret. And he said, um, he said he'd been married to the same woman for 50 years, she died. He figured he'd go it alone. And then after about three months he said, and I quote, living alone is lousy. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a woman in his social circle whose husband had just died. They had never been romantically interested in each other before, but he got remarried and he's, he's really, really happy, as is she. Uh, having somebody else is very important. Now, we don't all get coupled up. Um, Oliver Sacks, actually, a, a friend of mine and colleague, uh, um, who uh, by his own admission was on the autistic spectrum, he fell in love late in life in his 70s. Uh, and as you may know, he was gay but closeted uh, because of stigma and his own um, difficulties admitting it openly. But he fell in love with a lovely man named Billy and they had a wonderful life together um, uh, that was fulfilling for both of them. Uh, but yes, not everybody gets coupled up um, and Fortunately, society is beginning to adjust. There are now intergenerational choirs where young people and old people sing together in, in communities. Uh, in Toronto, one of the universities that had a housing shortage in dormitory space uh, crafted a situation where college students are living with older adults in a kind of combination dorm supervised living facility where they interact with each other and help each other. So there are, are things to do. Uh, and if you're mobile and you're older and alone, really one of the best things you can do is volunteer. Go to a hospital, go to read to young children in a school, uh, work a soup kitchen, anything to, to keep your social, a bridge group, a reading group, coming to an independent bookstore for a book <laughs> event. Hi, uh, excellent uh, discussion, thank you. I hate to bring up this more negative topic, but- Oh, do I have spinach in my teeth? <laughs> no, <laughs> so the CDC has re been reporting an increase in incidence of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. So, you know, we're discussing how people are aging well. Would you comment about, you know, these kind of illnesses? Right, so to repeat the question, uh, there, the, the, the number of cases of Alzheimer's being diagnosed is certainly on the rise. And um, I, I looked at this very carefully, and then just to check my understanding of it, you don't, you know, I, I know the limits of my own knowledge. Uh, I'm not an Alzheimer's specialist, and so in putting together the book, I do feel that I know how to read a scientific article, but just to be sure, I went and consulted a number of experts, actually 30 different experts in various fields, read either portions of the book or the entire book. And one of those experts was Stan Prusner, who won the Nobel Prize in neuroscience, as a neuroscientist in med uh, med physiology or medicine, it's called, but for his work on neuroscience and the discovery of prions, which seem to be implicated in Alzheimer's. And I saw him just a few weeks ago uh, at his office at UCSF. When you get a Nobel Prize, they give you the whole floor of the building. <laughs> uh, and, and they give you all kinds of people to bring you coffee and tea and uh, manage your appointments and such. And I said to Stan, my reading of all of this is that yes, Alzheimer's diagnoses are on the rise, but the single biggest risk factor for getting it is aging and there are more aging people. They're not dying of cancer or other things, and so you know the proportions are staying the same. He says that's absolutely right. So as of six weeks ago, that not published yet, but it's, it's, what was true a year and a half ago about that is still true. Uh, 
Um, so I've read your book, This Is Your Brain on Music, and you've mentioned a lot of musicians, um, and so I was wondering how music falls into all of this. Well, thank you. Um, I, um, I do talk a bit in the book about the, uh, the benefits of music and music therapy. Um, any of you see the movie Alive Inside, in which Oliver Sacks appeared? Uh, it was a, a film about a gentleman who was uh, basically in a catatonic Part of, the, part of the film, uh, there's a man named Henry who's in a catatonic state. He's got Alzheimer's, advanced. He doesn't recognize his friends and family. He doesn't know where he is. It's tremendously disorienting to have this global memory loss. You look around, you don't know where you are. You look in the face of somebody that people tell you you've known for 50 years and you don't recognize them. You might even look in the mirror and not recognize yourself. You can't remember from one hour to the next what's happening. This is something that causes tremendous agitation and grief, disorientation. Uh, but in situations like this, as depicted in the film and uh, at the Institute for Neurological Function here in New York uh, and in uh, hospitals around the country, you play music for many patients like this and because music is one of the last things to go in memory loss, it's a way for them to reconnect with themselves, to rediscover who they are, to be oriented instead of disoriented. And just as Dyrell lit up to music in the subway, Henry in the film is like a kid again, and he starts talking, and the nurses can't believe it. He hasn't spoken in months, and he's talking about the music making him want to move and think about love, and uh, you know all of these thoughts that had es escaped him and eluded him before. So music plays an important role there, um, soothing and comforting both the patients and their families, and you know, learning an instrument is also a great cognitive enhancer. You can learn an instrument at any age. It's never, you're never too old to start. Uh, it, it, it's absolutely true. I have a professor who didn't start playing the piano until he was 50, which sounds relatively late. Uh, but he's 75 now, and he's been diligently playing 20 minutes a day, which most people can fit in 20 minutes, and he's pretty good now. Uh, he plays for himself, he plays at parties, and I've heard of people starting uh, instruments at 70, very good for the brain. Uh, it involves manual eye-hand coordination, feedback between what your motor system is doing and what you're hearing. Are, are you yourself a musician? What do you play? Um, I'm a pianist, but I'm mainly a singer. So when you mentioned choirs, I was interested in that. And um, what style do you sing? I sing choral music. And what style of piano do you play? Classical, mainly. Do you have a favorite pianist? Um, uh, Earl Wilde, I would say. And do you have a favorite pianist for Debussy? <laughs> um, I feel like that's a leading question. No, no, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. Um, oh, I, I just guess. find that some pianists ruin it for me and others really enhance it. It's a funny thing. Uh, a French pianist named Jean-Yves Thibaudet. I really oh, yes. Like yeah. yeah. Nice taste. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, uh, the great cellist Pablo Casals, this is an often repeated story among musicians, towards the end of his life, uh, he, an interviewer said, you know, you, you've done everything that can be done on the cello. You're widely regarded as one of the great cellists who ever lived. Why are you still practicing? And he said in his 80s, because I want to get better. <laughs> I have a question. I've been witnessing family members, elderly, um, passing or near passing from congestive heart failure or some heart ailment. Uh, to me, heart is the fuel that makes the brain operable. So do you cover how the heart symptoms can be watched a bit more throughout life? I've also heard that for women, heart failure can be a silent killer. So that's my question. Well, so I'm a neuroscientist, not a cardiologist, and I approach the topic from really what's going on in the neck up. But I do talk about pain, and I talk about cardiovascular disease, particularly uh, heart uh, disease in the context of diet and, and heart-healthy foods and in the context of exercise. Um, 
basically, um, so, you know, a lot of this is genetic, and there's not much you can do about it. But genetics is not a death sentence, uh, except in a few very rare cases. Even if heart disease runs in your family, there are lifestyle changes you can make that will tilt the balance in your favor. And those involve all the things the doctors have been telling you. Uh, healthy diet, uh, exercise. Uh, and you know, for people who don't enjoy exercise or feel that they can't take the time, it turns out the, the, the big surprise of the last year or two of research is that um, if you look at the curves, the, the, the graphs of, of how much exercise translates into how much improvement in heart health, the biggest gain in the curve um, isn't between, say, exercising 15 minutes a day and an hour a day, or between exercising uh, three times a week and every day. The biggest change is between doing nothing and doing something. <laughs> Just getting up off the couch and going for a walk around the block is about 90% of it. So uh, you don't have to do a lot, and if you are particularly heart-focused, uh, high-intensity interval training. Get your blood going for 30 seconds. Stop for a couple of minutes, another 30 seconds. These are very helpful, uh, and you know, with, with everybody's grasp. Roger. Um, I, can, I can understand the Concept. Sorry, thanks. I can understand the concept of starting an, an instrument when you're 50 years old, but what if you've been a musician all your life? Um, do you have to start a new instrument, or can you keep? <laughs> can are you still? You know, have you gotten that benefit of what that person would get at 50 years old, or is it enough to just to try to get better at what it is that you do? Um, this is my friend Roger Rosenberg, who is one of the finest saxophonists in the world. He played with, and uh, his, uh, he's about 50 years old, I'd say. Yeah, and right. <laughs> his, solo, his solo CDs, you've got to check them out. They're just divine. Um, well, you know, uh, I wouldn't presume to tell you Roger, what to do, but my hunch yeah. is, uh, you know, from having read biographies of Arthur Rubinstein and, and having heard stories about Miles Davis from people who played with him, and, you know, you've heard these kinds of stories too. No, I don't think you need to pick up a new instrument, but it can be helpful to approach your own instrument differently. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, one of the people I interviewed for my book was Sonny Rollins, uh, another great uh, saxophonist. Uh, and we had a wonderful conversation, and he's somebody who, if you followed him, uh, you know that he's tried to reinvent himself. He, he took a sabbatical uh, for two years and just played underneath the Brooklyn Bridge because he was trying to find different ways of approaching his instrument. And until he got a lung disease that prevented him from playing, he was constantly thinking, um, are there some techniques that I can develop that I don't have? Are there um, different uh, different repertoires that I can play? Uh, he got interested in Eastern music and started playing that, and, and um, got into classical music. So, I, you know, I, I would say. You know, you already are a multi-instrumentalist. You play the, the flute and the soprano and the baritone sax, and you know, I think you've got a full life just trying to figure out new tunes and new... And the other thing is, going back over old tunes, when I was in music school, I had to learn to play the Moonlight Sonata. Uh, and I'm, I mean, I wasn't a pianist, but you know, the, the part of the qualifying exam was I had to learn to play Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. And about, and then I didn't play it again for 20 years. And for the last 20 years, I've been working on it. And it's interesting because it's not technically a difficult piece to get under the fingers, nor is the Chopin Prelude in E minor, for example, very easy to get your fingers in the right place. But to make it sound like music, I've been working on that for 20 years, and, and I'll never finish. And I, I believe that that's uh, mentally challenging from all the research we've done and the neuroimaging studies and such. But I mean, you're one of the most beautiful players I've ever heard, so. Thanks. And unfortunately, only. Oh, sorry. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. Unfortunately, we only have time for one last question, which will be right over here. Thank you very much. Actually, I've got a question and a half because I think you might have answered one already. But uh, I'm a professional opera singer, and my job is to memorize three-hour-long beats, you know, uh, pieces of music and uh, words. I've seen articles coming out in recent years uh, explaining that the memorization and learning of music can slow cognitive decline. Correct? Yes. This is generally known. So, what advice would you have for people who are not trained? musicians or not active musicians um, to sort of uh, get that same benefit as they age. And my second question, just very quickly, is have you been hanging out with David Sinclair at all? And um, yeah, I, 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 I haven't read your newest book yet. I, I, uh, I uh, interviewed David for the book, and he's quoted in the book, and we've had some exchanges of uh, ideas, and he's got some uh, really solid science behind what he's looking at, and he's got some controversial opinions about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to wait for some of that to play out. Um, the, uh, <laughs> one of my favorite parts of the book is that David said that he had started taking NAD+. Plus supplements, which are not commercially available in a, a, a safe form for humans, but he's a researcher and he's skimming off the top of the supply that the pharmaceutical companies give him for the mice. <laughs> and uh, um, I, uh, I asked uh, another colleague who's in the same field of longevity research, actually the head of the National Institute of Aging at the uh, National Institutes of Health in Washington, I said, uh, you know, you taking anything? And he says, no, no. I said, uh, well, you know, David's taking NAD+. And there's a lot of evidence that uh, it really extends lifespan in mice. And the guy from NIH says, yeah, well, I'll tell you, there's one reason why I'm not taking it. And I said, what? He says, I am not a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> And he then gave me the litany of things that I already knew, which is, you know, 95% of the things that work in mice don't work in humans, and some of them are dangerous. Um, but I think that, to get to your first question, uh, music is just one of many different ways to practice uh, your memory and enhance your memory. There's no one road that will get you there. If you've got a hobby, if it's sports, uh, if it's baseball, um, you know, keeping track of the stats of your favorite players, talking about them with other people, uh, revisiting the stats of the greats like Mickey Mantle and Babe Ruth, and, and you know, learning more about their game. Uh, if it's art, uh, continuing to paint and develop new techniques, which Joni Mitchell continues to do. She's a great painter. She's, by many accounts, a better painter than, than musician. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, whatever it is that is your passion, uh, immersing yourself in it will develop your memory because if you're into something, you've got to have memory for it. Thank you so much for being generous with your time. Thank you.